tēnā tātou, nei rā te tua kei ki te whakamihi atu ki a tātou, me te tō mai ngā manaaki tanga o te runga rawa i runga i o tātou whakawhiti ngā kōrero i tēnei pō. E takoto mai nā te whanganui a tara, e riporipo nei, e riporipo nā, ko ngā tahua te whenua, whakatairanga tiake, ko te haukāinga, ko te atiawa, rāwa tahi, ko ngā te tōranga tira, e tau nei roto i te upoko o te ika. Nō reira rarau mai ki te kakau o te kōrero e hikamā, ko te oranga tonu tanga o te moana te take. Mō ngai Māori, hei reira te tahi whare, ko te whare o tangaro, ki uta te tahi whare, ko te whare o tāne. Nō reira whakatairanga tia e rā mea e rua, hei reira i te tōpuni tanga ko te oranga o te tangata. Nō reira hui mai i raro i te taumatua, i te taumarumaru o tēnei whare e tū nei, o ti rā ngai ui kwa whakakao mai nei. Nō reira tō ia mai, mānawa mai te Māori o nuku, tō ia mai, mānawa mai te Māori o rangi. Te Māori ka pai heretia te ira tangata ki tōna u kai pō, whakatīna kia tīna, ka tipu, ka rea, ka puta, te uhu ki te whaiau ki te ao mārama, uhi wero tau mai te Māori haumie, huie, tāe ki e. Tēnā tātā. Tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou. Um, I'm Amy Ryburn, I'm a partner here at Buttle Findlay, and I just wanted to say welcome. Um, we have had a long relationship with uh, WWF over a long period of time, and so we're delighted to host you here this evening. Um, I just wanted to make two logistical points. Um, firstly, if you need to go to the bathroom, it's just out the door and to the left before you get to reception. And the reason why I point that out is that is also the way you go if we need to exit the building in the case of an emergency, which hopefully we don't. Um, and I just also wanted to point out, obviously we've got hand sanitizer around the room and you're socially distanced, so um, thank you very much for your cooperation uh, and respecting the guidelines, we really appreciate it. And that's it from me. Sure. Thank you, tēnā koutou. Uh, ena mana, ena reo, ena karanga maha o te wā tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Atlantic, ko Pacific, ko Whitirea, nga moana. Ko Le Courlis te awa, ko Makara toku puke. Ko uh, French, ko Australian, ko Hungarian, nga iwi. Ko he whangai a hau o te iwi o nga tikuri. Ko Le Londe, ko Esahazi, ko Raharui, nga hapu. No France, no Australia, no Aotearoa, a hau. Kei te whanganui a tāra, ahau e nohana. Kei WWF, ahau e mahi ana. He kai hautu, ahau. Ko Livia Estahazi tōku ingoa, nō reira. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Welcome everyone to our Moana, our future this evening. Uh, I'm Livia, the CEO of WWF. For those who don't know me, and I think I do actually know everybody in this room, which is great. Uh, and as you do know, I am a bit from all over the world, but wherever I have come from all over the world, I've always been near the ocean, whether it was the Atlantic, the Pacific, or here, uh, again, in the Pacific, in, in New Zealand. Um, so it's a big part. So this mahi that we're, we're doing tonight is really, really important and close to my heart. So I wanted to acknowledge and thank quite a few people here tonight. Of course, first of all, our speakers, our panellists, uh, the Honourable James Shaw, representing the Green Party, the Honourable Scott Simpson, representing the National Party, thank you. Uh, Takuta Ferris, representing the Māori Party, Angie Warren-Clark, representing the Labour Party, uh, and Jeff Simmons, representing the Opportunities Party. Thank you all so much for coming here tonight. Uh, I know that you are super busy. It's a busy time right before the election, um, but it's very, very important as well. I also wanted to uh, thank you too, Corin Dan, from Radio uh, New Zealand, Morning's Report, for moderating the debate. Uh, and finally, thank you all so much, guests, this evening for actually making the time for this uh, important debate to happen, and as well, all those online uh, watching. Uh, last count, we had about 700 people registered uh, for the live streaming, so it should be great, a great watch. Um, I also wanted to do a big uh, kia ora and thank you to Takuta for opening us and for your lovely karakia. Thank you so much. Um, our ocean is in crisis. Uh, it has paid a high price for our development. I think we all know this and as a result of our own unsustainable activity. We've seen a serious decline in ocean health over the past few decades. Not only does the ocean sustain every single uh, life on Earth, it's absolutely crucial to our fight against climate change. 
So at the moment in law, we know that we have less than our uh, less than one percent of our coastal and marine areas fully fully protected. And according to a survey result that we did in January uh, this year, 80% of New Zealand don't think that's good enough. We need transformational change in order to restore the health of our ocean, not just for the environment, uh, but for cultural, social and economic reasons. Our fisheries uh, and our aquaculture will not survive with an ocean that is unhealthy. For coastal and indigenous, indigenous communities in Aotearoa, the ocean is an integral part of their history, stories and ancestry. Restoring the Modi is absolutely essential for human well-being. So this evening, our politicians will discuss marine protection, fishing practices, indigenous rights and much more. And at the end, we'll have 15 minutes for the audience members to ask questions. So please keep this in mind. And finally, we absolutely encourage posting during our social media event uh, about the event. So please remember to hashtag, hashtag our Moana, our future. Uh, and you can always tag WWF uh, New Zealand will we'll help repost. So I just wanted to thank you again. And uh, as closing on my opening remarks, a little whakatoki from Ngāti Kuri. Tautato ha i te tuatahi ko te moana. Ha tuarua no tato te whenua. Our first breath is drawn from the ocean, the second from our land. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenatato, katoa. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, welcome everybody to this debate. I'm not going to talk for too long and we'll get right into it because there are a lot of really crunchy issues to get into uh, with the oceans. Doing some research, research into this, it was clear to me that there is a lot to get through. Just some uh, format issues. We should have about 50 minutes or so, give or take uh, a few minutes to for the substantive debate. Uh, I'll try and keep uh, all of uh, the participants on track and uh, within reasonable time and make sure it's nice and even. Uh, it, this is being recorded. And then at about five to seven, perhaps a little bit earlier, we'll, uh, we'll have a sum up, a one minute sum up from each of the participants. And then there'll be a short break, maybe a minute or so, where you can grab a drink uh, that will be up the back, uh, at which point uh, you can gather yourself and come back and ask some questions. We'll have about 15 to, uh, to 20 minutes for questions. The videoing will stop at that point, so you don't have to worry about that. But I do encourage you to use a microphone, which is over there by the window, if you can. Uh, if you can't, I'll, I'll relay your question back. I've also got some questions that have come in uh, via social media over the last few days on some of these issues as well, which I'll try and pepper in uh, as we go. Uh, to begin with, though, I think it's important to get a sense of who our participants are tonight. They have been introduced, but I'll, I might start with a few questions that just give us a sense of who they are and their um, connection to the ocean and how they feel about the ocean and the marine environment. So welcome to you all. I'll start down the end, Angie. Gender diversity goes first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want you to just give us a little, as, if, think of it like your chance to sort of start things off a bit of a scene setter, if you like. Uh, what is your relationship with it? When you think of the ocean, people often talk about their relationship with the land. What is your relationship to the ocean? How does that make you feel living in New Zealand? Well, uh, the ocean is extremely important to me. I grew up in the Bay of Islands um, and have moved to Tauranga Moana. So my entire life I have lived um, beside the sea or close to the sea. I've uh, dived, I've surfed, I'm a mad keen fisherwoman. I've fished all my life, I uh, continue to fish now. 150 metres from this, um, the seashore is where I live. Uh, the sea is my anchor. Um, it, it's my happy place, it's the place that I go to when I need to think on hard things and to be replenished as well. Lovely. So, yeah. Jeff? Yeah, I mean, uh, I grew up in, um, on, on the West Coast and I think I have a special um, theory that West Coasters are different because the, the, the sea is so wild there and we're used to getting kicked around and not being able to control stuff and we like things a bit, we don't mind if things are a bit messier because that's what the West Coast does. Um, so yeah, I mean, but I didn't really realize until I went overseas just how massive New Zealand's ocean is and, and what a big part of our culture it is. Uh, and it's until you live somewhere that's a long way away from the ocean and it's not easy to get to the ocean, I think that, that you really start to appreciate what it, 
uh, what a special uh, resource that we have here in New Zealand. Lovely. James? Well, I was sitting uh, at the back of my class talking with my friends, as you sometimes do, and you know how you have that experience where you discover that you're still talking and everyone else has gone quiet. I had that experience, and I turned around and turned into my teacher, who the first words I heard him saying were, um, countries go to war over things like this. And it was the day after the bombing of the Rainbow Warrior uh, in Auckland Harbour. Um, and so that was the moment that I became aware of what was going on in the Pacific, um, with nuclear testing in the Pacific. Uh, and, and that really is what got me into environmentalism, um, was via the oceans, and in particular, um, in particular the marine environment uh, in, in the Pacific Ocean, until 1990, which is when I joined the Green Party. Um, and I'm a diver, and like to spend, uh, when I can, um, which isn't often, I like to spend time under, uh, in about, as, about as deep down in the ocean as I can, and so some of the most extraordinary experiences of my entire life have been um, deep under the waves. Lovely. Scott? Thanks, Corin. Um, I'm the Member of Parliament for Coromandel, uh, the beautiful Coromandel, and uh, it's one of... I say that for Livia because she hasn't been to the Coromandel, and I always say it's pre preface with it. I want to rub it in for her. Um, but um, my uh, great-grandparents arrived on the Coromandel in the 1880s at a place called Kuatunu, where I still have a, a property overlooking the beach, and um, it's my happy place, even though these days I live in Thames. And some of my earliest um, childhood memories are actually uh, collecting kai moana, um, uh, pippi, mussels, tuatua, tua, um, uh, uh, around uh, the beaches of uh, uh, the eastern seaboard of the Coromandel Peninsula, uh, basically having a, a cook up on the beach um, and that's very much part of uh, my upbringing and my family's upbringing and as others have said it's not until sometimes we become a little bit older that we realise um, actually that kind of upbringing is not the norm, it's unusual um, and that makes it all the more precious. Lovely. Takuta. Uh, yeah, kia ora tato. Um, well I'm a typical um, rural raised Māori boy, really. I grew up in a, grew up in a place called Pōrangaho. Uh, it's South Hawke's Bay. It's pretty uh, as remote as you can get, and uh, it's on the doorstep of Te Moana Nui Akiwa. So we grew up in and around and on the um, ocean, and just as our fathers did and grandfathers did, and we grew up on commercial boats and surfing and diving and fishing and chasing eels and pātiki and all sorts of things. Anything you could imagine, we did it. Um, and like, um, like it's been said, as you get older, you sort of start to reflect on those things differently and you realise that those are actually tools to pass on um, information and ways of living, ways of life and um, viewpoints of your tipuna that were passed to you. And so now I pass them on to my kids and this is one of my children here, Hai Mataarangi. Most of our kids we named after the sea. Um, and me and my wife, we reside in Ōtaki and we live at the beach, so you walk across the road and you're at the beach. So it's pretty much a daily part of our lives. Um, Te Ao Māori have been staunch fighters for the ocean forever and the reason we are is that we've been so dispossessed on land that the ocean is the place where we has housed a lot of our history and a lot of our ability to live as Māori. So I think in 2004 Te Ao Māori stood up and went to war for the ocean and that gave birth to the Māori Party. So here we are. Kia ora. All right, so it's pretty clear that the ocean is extremely important to all of you. It, it, it is something that is deep in many ways. So let's get right down to it. Marine protected areas, it seems uh, from doing some research into this before this debate that this is an area that New Zealand was once good at and is now lagging m miles behind on. So I'll come to you, James Shaw, as someone who's in the part of the governing arrangement. What's happened over the last three years? Why has New Zealand not made progress? What are we, 0.4% of our oceans protected, miles away from 10%, miles away from the goal of 30%. What has happened? Well, um, to give you a list of what we've done uh, over the course of the... Thank you for the question. Uh, <laughs> of what we've done. So we, we've um, reviewed the Hectors and Maui Dolphin Management Plan and we've doubled the area uh, available um, there, the, the area that's protected there. Um, we've released the National Action Plan on seabirds, um, which has a goal of zero seabird um, bycatch. Um, we've supported uh, David Parker's freshwater reforms and we'd like to go further, um, but um, we feel like we've sort of broken the back of that at last. Um, we've completed 
public consultation on the network of southeast to South Island West, uh, West um, Marine Protected Areas. Um, and we do want to make sure that those things go through. Um, and we've started the process of putting so lots of on lots boats. of stuff going on. But yes. that big overarching piece of refresh legislation that will set up the framework yeah. for marine protected areas. What has happened? Why has there not been the progress some had hoped for? Well, uh, let's just say that there's a party that's not participating in this debate, um, uh, which has meant that we haven't been able to make as much progress as we would have liked to over the course of the last three years. And we're hoping not to have to worry about that in the next three years. Well, you could have. Could you not have reached across to the person who's sitting next to you, Scott Absolutely. Simpson, and asked him, was Absolutely. there scope, and I'll come to you on this, Scott, was there, do you share the view that we do need a refreshed piece of legislation on mm. marine protected areas? Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so could there, what would you do? Is there scope to get this done if you were in government? Well, we, we um, Corin, made the invitation uh, numerous times over the last three years to cooperate collaboratively with uh, the government to provide... Um, improved marine protection legislation, uh, improved uh, areas of marine protected uh, sea space, um, and most importantly, we made the invitation numerous times to collaborate to ensure the uh, uh, Kumadek Ocean Sanctuary would be set up as was intended, as was promised by this government uh, in the speech from the throne, zero progress. So what we've actually had is three years of nothing, very little, no new marine reserves created, no progress on marine protected uh, areas legislation, uh, no progress on the Kumadek Ocean Sanctuary, and it's been three wasted years. Angie, I'll get you to respond to that. Three wasted years? Not at all. Not at all. Um, I think these things take a lot of time to work on. Um, we have had a really clear plan. We haven't got perhaps to the end where we wanted to get to. Certainly with the Kermadex, there was an issue that we needed to work on, which was around relationships. Um, can't come in and just create a piece of legislation without talking to tangata whenua. Um, and so that is, that is um, something that we have been working on. Um, and yeah, so- There wasn't any talking. Had, there was. So why no progress? Try, because we're trying to clean up your mess, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we will, we will come to the Kuma decks in some detail at some point, but I just want to push on with this. So, Angie, before I come to the others, on current polling, Labour is in a strong position. What guarantees would you give that if you were in a position where you weren't perhaps having to have a co complex coalition arrangement, that you will push through with some urgency the rewrite of the Marine Reserves, Marine Protected Areas legislation? Look, I think it's really clear that we agree that 30% um, of uh, marine reserves, 30% of marine reserves is a good and lofty goal. I think um, we have committed to, um, to reaching that by 2030. Um, however, um, as a backbencher, of course, you would understand my party is very keen and we're, we're absolutely, including with our uh, Māori Party members, um, are very keen, very keen to see a movement. OK, I'm going to come to the, the two that are outside Parliament, hearing what they're hearing from those who are inside Parliament. Takuta Ferris, what is your view of the performance of the current Parliament in dealing with these issues? Um, yeah, kia ora, kia ora tato. Um, I think if we, as a country, <clears throat> have learned one thing out of this year, it's that anything can be done really quick. And, um, you know, if you look out that window over there, that ocean out there is, um, has sustained us forever. And if we keep mucking around, um, it's going to run out of time. You know. it, this, this is a pretty easy thing to understand. And it just always comes back to political will to actually push the button, hit go, and put the foot on the accelerator. Um, so there's number one. Number two is that um, Western thinking has got us right into the crux of this problem we're in, right? And so I can guarantee you that Western thinking won't be the thing that gets us out of it. And so uh, Māori managed to live in harmony with ocean environments for more than a thousand years. And um, I think the, uh, the consistent, steady, consistent uh, ignoring of that needs to be rec re reckoned. Okay? And uh, we just come back to a place where you have the goal, if you've got the capability, pull it together, produce a solution, hit the go button. Jeff Simmons, um, I'm imagining the fishing industry 
would argue they're a $4 billion industry, hugely important to the economic future of this country. We're heading into a period of you know, poor growth, real economic uncertainty. How difficult is it to balance? How difficult is it for those in Parliament who do have that role to balance those competing interests? Well, <coughs> with the exception of lobster, which is an issue, uh, fish move. So marine protection is no problem. Fish move around. So that shouldn't really be a barrier to, to marine protection at all. And in fact, we know that when you get an abundance of life in marine reserves, that spills over into the area around it and makes up for, I said with the exception of lobster, I think there's quite good evidence that for other fish stocks, it makes up for the fact that they are losing some space in marine reserves and having uh, you know, that, that greater abundance in the areas in the other areas that they do fish in. But there's more than just fisheries operating in the ocean. We've got shipping, we've got uh, you know, new ideas around energy, around aquaculture, you know, uh, open space, uh, open sea aquaculture, talk about seaweed farming. I mean, we need a full marine spatial plan. And when you talk to businesses about doing something like that, they're perfectly happy with some of that being set aside for nature. I mean, that just gives them some certainty, some business certainty. So I think in, uh, having a, a conversation about protection in the context of a, of a broader conversation about ocean use, quite reasonable. Well, let me just go, and Angie mentioned this, and I'll, start with, I'll stay with you, Jeff, on this. The 30% goal of having 30% protected, protected areas by, what, 2030, that's a big goal. Is that something TOP would, would commit to? Absolutely. I mean, 30% of protected areas... I mean, you'd want a big chunk of that to be no-take, but not all of that's going to be no-take. Some of it's going to be, you know, benthic protected areas to where, where there's no trawling. Some of it's going to be recreational only, matai type uh, reserves. And, you know, I, I think 30% in that, in that context is easily doable. Let's just come back down the panel on that one, James, 30%. Uh, and, and is it just a lofty, ambitious goal, or is it something you can actually commit to? No, it, it, it absolutely is. Um, but the issues that you've got in setting yourself that goal are exactly the same issues that you have around Kermadex. And so when I um, elbowed um, Scott before about the mess that they had and talking about moving quickly, the issue around Rangitahua was that the government moved very quickly, didn't consult with Māori, uh, and cut right across uh, you know, tr treaty settlements, um, at which the whole QMS is tied up in. Um, and so if you wanted to then take that and essentially double the size uh, of that, you have all of the same issues. And so um, iwi and Māori need to be deeply involved in the development of that kind of spatial plan and that kind of marine um, uh, protection. The problem that we had with um, the um, Kermadec Rangitahua sanctuary was that um, it was sort of tried to be imposed in a very short period of time without um, actually going through that process. Yes, but that was under the last government. I mean, you, 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 you had it in your coalition agreement, right? Yes, we did. And, like and so it, you've had three years to... to that. Isn't that long enough to sort it out? Well, it, it should have been. Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's something that I deeply regret that we didn't get across the line. But ultimately, we had resistance in the government. And it doesn't matter who... If you, even if you've got support from the opposition, if you can't get a cabinet paper through cabinet sure. because it's being opposed, because you've got a party there with deep ties to the um, fishing industry... Then, then you can't get it through. Scott, I want to oh. com come to you on that. Yeah. Um, so just take us back, because this was a national party proposal, the Kermadex. Right. I remember John Key unveiled it at the United Nations to great fanfare. He, he did jump the gun. I was there with him. Mm. He jumped the gun. He did not get the... Uh, he didn't talk to Iwi properly, did he? Mm. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, probably no. I, I actually chaired the select committee that heard that legislation, and I heard the impassioned pleas from uh, Iwi, and it was pretty obvious that... Uh, in terms of the um, foundational work ahead of the announcement at the UN, it was pretty minimal, and that was a mistake, clearly. Um, but for the last three years, there has been a majority in the Parliament of New Zealand for the creation of a sanctuary. Um, and you don't need a cabinet paper, you don't need a government approval or a stamp or saying you can proceed. Uh, the first rule of politics is learn to count. And in our parliamentary democracy, if you have 61 votes or more, you can pass legislation. But you would appreciate that, that what that would have done to the... To, that would have... Any government in that situation is going to be pretty wary about upsetting the apple cart by doing that. Um, not, if they're, not if they're 
committed and keen on the principles upon which they profess to stand. Takuta, what's your perspective on this in terms, because this is very complex when it comes to treaty settlement issues, it's very complex in terms of the mana whenua that is uh, involved in this Kermadec issue. What's your perspective? Oh, look, I challenge the complexity of treaty issues. <coughs> They're really not that complex at all. All you have to do is make sure that you consult with the people, the tangata whenua of their place, and you work your way to a decision. And when you arrive at the decision, you get on and do it. You know, I... I um, <coughs> I've spent a lot of time working with and around Iwi. And um, the thing that continues to fail the relationship is a lack of continued and consistent engagement. Okay, so the government will only ever arrive when they want something from us. So, you know, I don't know about you, but that might not be the basis of a good, strong relationship, you know, and enable you to make critical conditions quickly. Um, But, you know, as long as... The other thing is that the political system... Political system's going to fail my daughter there, right? So James just talked about a system that doesn't allow him, for sake of numbers, to do something that the, com- the country and the people need. And so where's the people can't afford that system? You know, because uh, time's running out, time's run out. You know, and uh, the people who live on these coasts, I come from a real remote coast, and we don't see a MAF officer all year. We might see one, one once a year. You know, but there are modes and there are models that enable us on those coasts to look after those coasts. They're under-resourced, they're not authorised, they're half pie, they're not quite cooked properly. All these types of things, they just scream out that the system is failing us. And if you keep trying to navigate your way through it while you continue to not talk to the tangata whenua, we're going to get nowhere really quick, which is the track record of this country. So I implore you to think about how you vote this year, because... The moana, and you know, Tatayao is not going to wait. It's never waited, if, and it never will. If the Māori Party it comes back into Parliament and let's say holds the balance of power, it's helping. It. Let's say hypothetically, it, it's the vote that counts. Would the Kermadec? Where would it be? Where would you be on the Kermadec? Would you be ready to get that through, or would it still need more work? Oh well, I, I think it it comes down to the to, to the quality of the conversations with the Tangata Whenua, right? So a simple question like, will the Kermadex work? Well, that's a, you've got to go and have discussions to make sure that that's nailed down. But um, as long as the tangata whenua, the people who reside in that place, have fished it, have, have swum in it, have sailed on it uh, for a thousand years, are involved and are happy, you will get things what across What would you say, just quick. before I move on, to, to the likes of Sandra Lee, who was on breakfast, I think, um, uh, last week or so, and say, suggesting that the treaty was being used as a bit of a, a barrier, almost, um, as an excuse by some in the fishing industry with the Māori interest in the fishing industry for not getting this done. Well, there's always going to be competing interests, you know, and um, unfortunately, that's an unintended consequence, consequence of treaty settlements. You know, it's probably not the preferred route that Māori would have taken is to carve things up and then commercialise a portion of it and leave uh, the rest of it in, in, in customary packaging. But... That's what we've got. So how do you work your way through that? You have to have a quality engagement system, which this country has never had. Okay? And if, if we built the quality engagement system, a lot of these things would be worked out quite quickly. Because Māori, just like everyone else in the country, want the ocean, the moana, to be thriving and to service the communities that need it. Angie, uh, Labour and the Kermadex, where would a... Labour government uh, with a bigger mandate, if that's what you get, go on the Kermadec. How much, what, where, does it, where does it sit on the priority list? Um, it's, it's up there with the priority list, but we, um, we have a lot of relationship to repair from the previous um, government when they were in power and made that decision. So we're not going to hurry this for the sake of hurry. We actually need to get this right for everyone, for all that are involved, because this this is um, you know thousands of square kilometres of marine reserve. It will bring us up to 15% of our entire uh, marine reserve quota. So it's really important that we get this right, and everyone is is travelling with us. Jeff. Uh, is this embarrassing to New Zealand internationally? I mean, we announced it at the UN to great fanfare. I know that some of the Americans were very keen on us doing it. It's been it's stalled. Yeah, it, <clears throat> it is embarrassing, I think. Um, but I have always wondered if focusing on the, the, the Kermadex in, in, in such a way was a productive thing to do. I mean, we need 
a representative network of marine reserves around New Zealand, and you know, having it all our eggs in one basket, I, I don't think was was wise from the outset. I mean, nice to have, absolutely, but it's not the whole story. Well, I'll stay with you on this because uh, I don't want to get too depressing, but it didn't go that well for the Campbell Island um, either, did it? Um, the Campbell Islands, in, in the sense that there was might have been some hopes that the reserve around that would have been increased as with the under the legislation that would to the review but the government was decided against it what was your thoughts on that Jeff um, I don't I'm going to draw an analogy with cycle lanes here uh, I, I don't know if you guys are aware with the the international evidence on cycle lanes and this is something New Zealand does very poorly but what works in getting cycle lanes is you just stick some planter boxes out and you give it a go and you see what happens and I think you know, I can understand the fishing industry being concerned about some of their interests down in the Southern Ocean around those sub-Antarctic islands, but why don't we just trial things for a few years? Why don't we have systems that can allow us to trial things and monitor the outcomes rather than having to draw permanent lines on maps without knowing exactly what the impact on the fishing industry will be? James, what's your, what was the inside perspective on what happened there? What, what happened? Why wasn't that? that was a, surely that was a great opportunity to expand yeah, the absolutely. protected area. Absolutely. And there were iwi interests involved there as well. And so, you know, as with the uh, Rangitahua, um, and all of every, every time you want to start, you know, mapping out the ocean, doing spatial plans, you have to um, ensure uh, that you've got iwi on side because you know there's but wasn't that, years, there's wasn't that a, a, a predetermined review in that legislation so that should have been known yeah, that was coming yeah well we knew it was coming but it's just having a review doesn't lead to an automatic automatic outcome right and and actually um you know we need to i i think that where we've got to get to uh, in this country um is some form of co-governance arrangement which looks after not just the um, fisheries, but the health of the oceans, uh, and and uh, you know I completely agree uh, with Jeff that actually you need to look at them as an integrated whole rather than this kind of species by species what, system that we've got. Okay, at the what, so what, so. what might that look like in your view? A co uh, arrangement? Look, I, I, I'm not going to. Well, I'm now's the time to do it. Table, We're right, an election so campaign. I'm, I'm, You're on camera. <laughs> go for it. Yeah, but, but. <laughs> We, I mean, th this, this, is, this, is, this is something that's starting to evolve in this country, right? So we've got some, um, in recent years, you've got uh, sort of examples um, like the Whanganui River um, to, um, to Uruwera and so on, where, uh, you know, you've got examples where, we've, where we've, I think we have gotten better than we have in the past. Um, if we want to think through a, um, a, a sustainable, and I mean that not just in an ecological sense, but something that's going to endure over time, uh, then we have to think through all of those issues when it comes to the sea uh, and our oceans. Um, uh, if we're going to be developing systems that are durable um, for uh, protecting the ocean, which may have implications for the current system under the QMS okay. and, 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 and those sort of issues. So I'm not saying it's not doable, right? I'm just saying that I, I think that we, you know, I completely agree with Angie. We've got to get this right. Um, and uh, and that takes time. I'm just wondering, Takuta, if there might be some scepticism here about hearing that, given the experience with the foreshore and seabed and the backlash, and that was some time ago now, but hopefully the world's moved on, but it, 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 it was pretty... I mean, it create, helped create the Māori Party um, in response. Uh, what, what do you think about that idea of a, of, of a co-ownership management system for the entire ocean around our oh, multi? Yeah, I think um, I think co-management, <clears throat> the co-management ideas uh, failed, and it will continue to fail. Um, what uh, you know, what the country needs is is Maori solutions championed by Maori entities. You know, and what Maori solutions require is treaty-based government. You know, instead of treaty-based governance. You know, it needs the uh, the treaty to be the ever-present thing in the discussion and the thing that binds the two parties together. You know, recognises them equally, affords them equal mana. You know, it's mana orite. It's a pretty common term around treaty um, issues. And without that mutual respect and acknowledgement, we'll struggle to we'll struggle to move. So until political parties and the government, you know, central agenda for the country comes to the matured idea 
that the country is built on the basis of two peoples and one partnership, we'll struggle to move. Okay, Scott Simpson, on this issue, and also I want to I want to ask you too about um, the Campbell Island issue as well. Would you firstly would you have extended the reserve around Campbell Island if you were in power? Um, yes, given the given the opportunity, um, you would have. What I yeah, yes, what I want to come back to though is this question of uh, the lack of action by the current government in terms of making progress and on um, marine protection. Full stop. The current government has simply chosen not to make marine protection a priority. Um, when it suited the government, uh, the current government, uh, we were able to work together on climate change issues. We were able to work collaboratively together on other issues. Uh, but on this issue and these issues, simply no political will from the current government. And, and I come back to the point that I made earlier. There has been a parliamentary majority in the current parliament for the last three years to make progress in this area and none has been made. That's an utter failure from a government that professes to rate it as a priority. Okay, I'll get Angie's response to that, but first, before I do, just a quick comment from you, Scott, on the idea of a, of a co-management type system that's been similar to, say, lakes and rivers yeah. for well, the I ocean. Think, um, uh, James made reference to uh, the Whanganui River, for instance, um, and it was um, my former colleague, Chris Finlayson, who sort of advanced the legal notion of uh, a river having its own legal um, status as, a, as an entity. Um, I think that's a, a concept that has merit. We use it, funnily enough, um, in the legal world. We're in, in, in a legal office. Um, we give we give um, uh, limited liability companies entity status. We give them the status of an of, a, of an individual, um, but we don't seem to be able to advance that concept in terms of the natural environment particularly well. I think Chris Finlayson made some really good progress in that area and and has essentially created a template. So you'd be open to so, a discussion? Uh... Well, uh, well, well, can I tell you what I, what I, th I think we have to get uh, a clear understanding of is um, uh, what a marine reserve is. You know, is it 100% no take or is it no take for some and uh, no take for some species or um, no take based on ethnicity uh, or, or what? And, and an area that I'd like to explore actually is um, the way that we uh, create reserves on the land is we don't just have, it's either not reserve or is reserve, it's not a sort of a binary thing, we have a menu of choices in terms of um, reserve status on land and I'd like to see us exploring an opportunity for having a more finessed, nuanced approach to marine reserves. Okay, I need to get a response from Angie, there was some criticism of the, first of all around the uh, Labour's and this government's progress on that area, but actually pick up on that point because I think that comes back to something that a lot of people want to know about and uh, some of the questions that have come in from the social media on this. Yep, sure. Uh, so, the, um, the, the nuances of, a, of the marine pre protection and how you would how would it, you would account for take and no take areas is that something labor would do so I think uh, there's some really interesting um, there's some really interesting case law that has just come out recently around Mortiti which is where I, I live and I look out at Mortiti Island and so there is um, there is a, a process now where the RMA um, is also looking at how we effectively manage areas so um, there are, there are particular areas which are now no longer usable by anyone at all in any kind of way. And this is, um, and that is designed to look at what has happened in that fishery. And I can tell you over many years of fishing there how degraded that fishery is. And then um, to uh, have the regional council study that to give us some really good sound advice um, and information about what is and isn't happening um, for our marine environment and then to report back and then to look at what's a sustainable take, customary, um, recreational and or commercial. So I think there are some, some clever ways that are uh, around fisheries management that are starting to happen. But really what we need to be looking at is a sustainable fishing model that meets everyone's needs. So the most important part of that though is the eco-based systems of fishing. We cannot continue to fish in a way that depletes or destroys our environment, our benthic floor, for example, or our species. We actually need to work out a way to do this better. All right. On that note, let's, uh, Jeff. I want to ask you about the issue of the um, 
bottom trawling in the areas. I actually, I'll start with you, but I want, to, I want a quick answer from all of you. Do we just get rid of bottom trawling full stop? End of story. Should we be doing it at all? You go first, Jeff. I think there's some areas where bottom trawling doesn't cause too much of an issue, um, but certainly we should be um, reducing the use of it and and increasing the the uh, you know the benthic protected areas to be um, actually in areas that we want to protect, not that are just too deep to fish, <laughs> which was how they were originally set up, which is a bit of a joke. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, there's there's some areas that where bottom trawling isn't too much of an impact on the environment. James? Yeah, we do need to move in that direction. You've got to remember that um, bottom trawling doesn't mean the same thing today that it did even 10 years ago, and, and, and now it's like vacuum cleaning. Um, the technology has gotten so advanced um, that the uh, nets are able to move in, um, over the ocean floor in a very sophisticated manner and, and scoop up things that they weren't able to scoop up uh, not too long ago. And so um, I do think that we need to restrict that um, progressively over Restrict time. or end it? Um, I, I, th I certainly think you need to move in that direction. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I, I don't want to commit to banning it just um, today, uh, but I do think that we, that the technology that we've got there is, um, you know, really extreme now, uh, and and I think we need to pull back on that. Scott, what's your thoughts? That so thirty percent at the moment is protected, isn't it? So is that is that enough, or should we be getting rid of bottom trawling altogether? No, 30, you're talking about 30% of marine reserves, no? No, I'm talking about in terms of the areas that it, you cannot bottom trawl at the moment. The, look, I, I think that yeah. Jeff and James have got it. Yeah. We've voted this thing. <laughs> well, that's what it's... Okay. Yeah. And, and Kath knows her stuff. Yeah, yeah she does. Um, but I'm with the, uh, essentially with James and uh, Jeff on this one. I think that we need to be moving in that direction. Um, but the technology available to fishers is much more sophisticated than it was even a few years ago. And that evolutionary trend will continue um, at pace, I think. Angie, I'll bounce back to you, then I'll come back to you, Takuta. Um, I, um, on a personal note, yes, I believe we should uh, ban inshore trawling, absolutely. Um, my party's position is a just transition. Um, we've got to um, move to better and more alternative, uh, more, more um, sustainable and alternative um, fishing methods. Um, however, it, it is... It is not an easy transition to make immediately, but it's one that we'll be investigating. Uh, Takuta, your view on this? Yeah, I think it's got a lot of issues. <clears throat> one of them is, this, is the scale of extraction. Um, the other one is that bottom trawling is actually a pretty rudimentary form of fishing, and there are plenty of um, better, more high-value ways to catch a fish. Uh, part of the bigger problem is, you know, our, our primary industry uh, economy is a fairly low-value one. And the uh, participants in those economies, whether them fishing or farming, have gotten away with not having to increase the value of what they do for a long time. And, you know, that sort of falls back to the political will of governments at any point in time. But as long as we don't address that, we'll keep taking as much out as we possibly can and putting very little back. OK, I want to throw in a question that's coming from uh, social media over the last few days. This one's from Joanna Moss at Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, thank you, Joanna. This one says New Zealand is currently... Oh. You're here. Fantastic. Well, you can just about ask it yourself if you want. <laughs> I'll read it out. Um, this is, uh, New Zealand is currently participating in negotiations at the UN for a new treaty on marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. This treaty aims at ensuring the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in the high seas and deep seabed. Could you please tell us, will you continue to support New Zealand's involvement in these negotiations? Uh, I'll start with you, Scott. Yes. That's easy. James? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Takuta? Uh, yes, as long as the tangata whenua are uh, in included. And there's a follow-up to that. It says, would, you, would your party consider it desirable for New Zealand to exercise greater global political leadership in pushing for an outcome of these negotiations? So tell us some more leadership. Mm. Yes. Um, look, we, we've got a, um, a, a good international reputation um, for better or for worse, but we have got a good international reputation. Um, in a whole range of areas, um, we're seen as a small nation that is not potentially a political um, uh, threat to other bigger nations, and we uh, are seen as a, a essentially honest brokers. So I think that we could, we could leverage our 
our state status and our position uh, to advance the cause. Do we have a good reputation when it comes to fishing management and the quota now? I mean, we certainly did. Jeff, is that still the case in your view from looking, looking at it? The QMS was world leading in 1986, but so was walk shorts. <laughs> so what would you do about it? Uh, I mean, I, I think we do need to reform the QMS. Of course, you know, uh, having uh, that, that's going to require a massive conversation with our, our treaty partner uh, to, to renegotiate that particular uh, agreement. But the fact that you've got a system where, which is, where you, and you mentioned this before, Corin, that is worth, uh, a fishing quota is worth at least $4 billion, and yet we can't afford to put cameras on boats, so we can't afford to not kill Maui's dolphins. I mean, that's because the system has a, a surf-like model, a surfdom-like model, where the, the quota owners lease out the, 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 the quota to the to the inshore fishers. I think the quota management system works okay offshore, but inshore, you've got these inshore fishers who are pushed to the edge, and that's where all of these poor behaviours come from. Uh, that absolutely needs reforming. Angie, do you agree? Does Labour view this as an area for reform? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it, it does, yes. Um, so I, I, I think essentially it's um, important that we, again, the just transition, the movement across. This is thir we're talking about, about 30,000 jobs. We're talking about the difference, um, the difference between um, having a meal or not. Um, and I think it's one of the things that we are, we are blessed with in our country is the opportunity to ensure we have abundance. But we need to manage um, what we're doing better. Um, so I think the system, um, it, it, it's not perfect. It needs to improve. I think it's a starting point. And I think... Oh. Thank you. I think it's a starting point, and I think that um, we need to. We are slowly moving towards an eco-based okay. system. Okay. Uh, I want to come to you, uh, Takuta, because uh, as we've been, you've been talking earlier on. I don't <coughs> I think it's pretty clear that nothing's going to happen in this space, or, or shouldn't happen, unless there is deep consultation with Māori. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's fair enough. But you know, <coughs> we grew up in a place called Port Angaho. I was a kid in the 80s. My uncles were commercial fishermen before the QMS came in. And the QMS was really targeted at there being a lot of small-scale fishermen. You know, the problem we have today is there are no longer a lot of small-scale fishermen. There are only a few gigantic ones. You know, and that's, that's the crux of the deal, man. That's why the system doesn't work anymore, and that's why it needs to be re-looked at. <coughs> um, you know, and, and there's, like, this isn't new or... It's not like no one knows this. You only got to go into a coast and have a talk in a pub to a few fishermen, or they're farmers now. They used to be fishermen and work this stuff out, right? But um, one thing's for sure you're not catching a, a crayfish around Auckland anymore. There aren't uh, many gurned left in the sea. Uh, snapper just coming back in a whole lot of areas. So, you know, we need to just cut to the chase and address the issue, which is the models of fishing are killing fish stocks. And if we don't sort it out, they'll be gone. Scott, is the is the is this just a case of ministers being too soft? We, I mean, I was shocked to see that the that the soft limit, twenty percent of the original, you know, biomass of a of a fish, um, you know, stock. That's what they call the soft limit, twenty percent. I mean, is it just a case where the, the ministers should be tougher in 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 putting restrictions in? Well, it's a personal view, but um, I think that that uh, could easily be the case. Um, but again, I um, just think back to a few years ago when. Um, the then MPI Minister Nathan Guy tried to reduce the recreational snapper catch um, and uh, there was practically civil insurrection around the, yes. around the countryside. And so um, if we are going to manage our fisheries stocks better, that's not just the commercial stock. We have to have a think, a long, hard think about recreational fishing as well. Um, and we actually we have to have a conversation as a nation, um, uh, all of us, about... Um, uh, you know what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, and I'm uh, on the basis of what I saw uh, a few years ago. I'm not sure that uh, that conversation could be easily and readily had. James, your view on the on the on the limits and the I guess the, the future of the quota management. So, Corin, one of the reasons I've been mean, slightly hesitant with my answers tonight is we're actually releasing um, one of our uh, big six. 
campaign priorities on Sunday, and it's on marine conservation and, <laughs> and fishing. Um, so the timing of this is slightly out of sequence for me. Well, but um, you're amongst friends. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I noticed there's a camera at the back of the room. Um, and, and so um, so I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but um, no. it is... Like the, the emerging, <laughs> the emerging consensus. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not going to take your advice on that, Scott. Um, uh, the, 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 the emerging consensus that uh, that we seem to have at the table is that the present system clearly is not working. Um, fish stocks are reducing rather than growing uh, in in most places. That we do need to move um, towards a different system and one that um, uh, both. Uh, ensures that Māori can exercise their, you know, kaitiakitanga rights and responsibilities, and um, the, um, what Takata was just saying about uh, actually <laughs> jigging the design to ensure that you do get that diversity uh, rather than these kind of big companies and so on. And that's quite a big system to unwind yeah. uh, if you're going to do that, right? So, um, so uh, tune in on Sunday. Fair enough. Uh, Angie, I'll come to you on the issue of bycatch, and uh, the Minister has been rolling out this new uh, cameras on the boat, yep. 345. Tell us a little bit more about that. Would, would Labour go further than that if it could? Well, I think that's just the first, um, the, the first tranche, and we will get to the, around about the 680 inshore boats. Um, I mean, essentially, it's, it's about uh, keeping and paying attention to what's happening on those boats, but also bycatch and what, what, um, what's disappearing over the shoot or um, and also what sort of birds and animals are um, being caught as well so it's a it's a whole system but yeah more cameras um, as time rolls on it's quite a complex uh, system to set up it's quite a complex uh, process to get um, cameras on boats it's not a Polaroid camera sitting there it, it is actually a whole connected system Jeff uh, do you buy that is, is it just taken too long for this to happen? Well, I, I just got to come back to the to the big picture here. You know, cameras on boats, you know, fantastic. But the analogy here is is that we've got a system where we've got feudal overlords sending out their their servants, their slaves, to to bring back a certain amount of corn, and then when they bring back a certain amount of corn that's that's uh, plucked wrongly or we or they've killed a few butterflies, we're whipping the servants. That's, that's the system that, that we've got at the moment. I mean, uh, these small fishes are under the hammer and, and to, to manage them and regulate them, uh, I mean, we need to do it, absolutely, but the, this just, is the, well, just the problem with the well, system. Is it, aren't the 345 cameras going on the bigger boats and the bigger fisheries? No, no, we're critical ones? no, no, because the, 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 um, the, they already have observers. I mean, the, the, the cameras on boats, yeah, the cam cameras on boats is largely for the, for the inshore fleet which generally the average inshore fisher person it doesn't own their own quota. They are leasing it off the big companies uh, and they have to go out and somehow catch this amount of snapper and not catch, oh sorry, catch gurnard and not catch the snapper. And uh, you know, th this crazy system tells them to, to basically chuck away half the fish that they, that they catch. It's James, what's your thoughts on that? Look, there's a reason why we didn't go as far as we wanted to on cameras on boats, and that's that party that I mentioned before with deep ties to the fishing industry um, who just basically dug their toes in for three years and wouldn't let us go the whole hog. Scott, what would, uh, what would National do on this? Well, well, we would have voted to support the government if they had wanted to continue with our decision to make cameras mandatory on all boats. On, all fishing, on commercial fishing boats. And um, this government said that they were going to do that and then reneged. And so this is another example where for three years there has been z pretty much zero progress. The technology is uh, these days pretty easy. It's not ridiculously expensive um, and it's effective. And so um, had this government wanted to pursue cameras on boats, they could have done. Who's paying for the cameras? Why is the question? Why is the it's taxpayer like paying? It's got almost every big fishing company has got one of the political well, targets. And the, perhaps there's... Okay, let's get an answer. James, same, let's go back to you. Again, there's what, one party that's not representing Why is it that the taxpayers pay for the cameras and not the big, the, big, if, the big fishing companies? Because that was the compromise that the government was able to thrash out around the cabinet table. So be very careful who you put around the cabinet table next time. 
Takuta, uh, what do you think about that? Is there any objection with, in terms of Ma the Māori Party when it comes to cameras on boats? Oh, no, nah, not at all. Get them in there. And do you think it should be something that the taxpayer pays? Well, it's, uh, you know, do you want them or not? So if I had to pay for them, I'd pay for them. But is that where it's got to? It's, it, it, it's just so difficult. So. Yeah. Apparently so. <clears throat> I would have thought that it was a, a, a legitimate and reasonable cost of doing business yeah. if you're a commercial fisher person. Yeah, of course. <coughs> okay. Does everyone agree with that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, let's just look a, little, look a little bit bigger picture um, in terms of international, uh, how New Zealand is going to cope with competing geopolitical interests in the Pacific. When we think of fishing stocks, we think of the, uh, the influence of uh, countries like China and others competing for those interests. What role should New Zealand play in that area, Scott? Well, I think we've got the potential to play a big role, um, and I think it's an area um, that we can literally, on an international stage, punch well above our weight. Um, uh, as I said earlier in reference to, a, to another um, question, uh, I think that we have got uh, internationally a, a, a well-regarded position that, that we could leverage, and I think we should be. James? Yeah, I mean, this actually comes back to the treaty that you were asking about before, because it would go beyond um, countries' exclusive economic zones and so deal with international waters and how we're protecting um, those and fishing in those. Uh, and so that is... You know, of, of huge concern uh, in the Pacific, and so um, that that would be. Um, one Where does way it fit when uh, you know in a bilateral discussion with uh, between our leaders and the say the Chinese leadership or another Taiwan, whoever else? Where does it fit in the priority list that you you say don't come don't overfish in our neighbourhood? I mean, where does it where does it fit? Well, ultimately, I think um, it needs to be high, uh, and it's in. I mean, ultimately, this is in the interests of those countries where you do have, have these massive uh, fleets of um, uh, fisher, fish, f uh, fishing companies that are much worse behaved than our own, um, actually. Uh, and the, um, because ultimately, uh, if they want to be able to fish for another, you know, beyond the next 20 years, there's going to have to be some fish left in the sea to do so. And it is not going in that direction at the moment. Takuta, does the Māori Party have a view on this in terms of um, supporting Pacific Island countries and their struggle <coughs> and whether New Zealand should be stepping up to do more? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think the Indigenous um, voice in the Pacific, you know, including us, we're a part of it. It's Te Moana Nui Akiwa. It's a single body. It's a single entity. It has commonality across a whole range of knowledge systems. Um, need to stand up and fight. And, you know, a good example of this, right? I'm a keen as recreational fisherman, but no one's caught a yellowfin tuna out of Tauranga or Waiho Bay for a long, long, long time. You know, thanks to the advent of um, tuna wrangling and gigantic pens that can be moved thousands of kilometres and basically just cut half the world off from a fish stock. Now, if you take predators like that out of a local ecosystem like ours, you're heading for disaster. You know, and there's, there's nothing new, people know that, but you just got to work out how to exert the most, uh, you know, influence in those conversations. Because, like you say, they're outside of jurisdiction. They're in international law. They land the country in the exact same place that Māori are with regard to the treaty and its treaty partner in this country. And so, you know, there might be a bit of uh, conversation in there that leads to better um, relationships all around the place. Scott, your view on this, and is New Zealand need, does New Zealand need to do more? Well. Um, we have an opportunity to do more, and if we have an opportunity, of course we should. Angie? Um, I think uh, that it's a broader picture as well, really, isn't it? If we look at our um, Pacific Island um, sisters and brothers, our nations, essentially, that why are they selling their fisheries um, off over, overseas? Actually, what is it about? What aid can we provide to support them to actually fish their own fishery or to actually just keep their fishery? It's, uh, it's about providing support and trade um, and not, say, not having this persuasive big, big bag of cash coming from somewhere else saying, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll give you $6 million for your tuna fishery in Rarotonga. And the, the people there going, actually, we need that money, we'll, we'll take it. So, Jeff, yeah. Quick comment from you on this, and then I'm going to get you all to do a, bit, a little bit of a, a final sum up. But, Jeff, just on that issue. Well, uh, Shane Jones did quite a good job. Uh, maybe we could send him back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, 
Sorry, no, but in, all, in all seriousness, climate change is going to be massive in the Pacific. I mean, when, when these coral reefs start going, um, you know, that's going to really uh, decimate local uh, fish populations. So we need to be working with those uh, countries to, to, you know, plan what we're going to do in terms of, you know, climate refugees, food stocks, all that sort of stuff. Well, actually, we've got a couple of minutes that more than I thought. Let's, let's just actually dwell on that climate change issue a little bit um, and how it might affect the thinking as it gets worse. Scott, what, where does that fit into your thinking in terms of when you look at ocean management and the threat, real threat, that climate change is going to have in so many different ways? Well, it's, it's um, an integral part of the ultimate uh, climate change uh, pathway that the globe has to uh, uh, move along. Um, uh, you know, just looking at a, a, a picture of the globe, it's immediately obvious how much of the surface of this planet is uh, ocean. And um, we, as human beings, all have uh, an obligation and a duty to ensure that... Um, Whatever our government is doing and whatever um, uh, uh, where we can assert uh, and exert uh, influence on other governments, then we should be working towards um, uh, weaving that into everything that we do. And, uh, you know, I just think that the climate change debate and discussion now is just, um, it's, it's almost just uh, a part of everyday activity on every issue, on every point of policy. And this ocean should be no different. James, you'd be pleased to hear that as the climate change minister. Um, where did the oceans fit into your thinking when you were spending the last three years nutting out your, your climate change legislation? Well, I mean, the oceans have actually absorbed most of the heat uh, that we've experienced through climate change um, over the course of the last few decades, and they are also getting to capacity, uh, and you know that, that heat will get released at a certain point. Um, and it is having uh, horrendous effects uh, on the marine environment, particularly through the destruction of um, coral. I was up in Niue um, just last year, and they'd had you know, huge bleaching around there, which is killing off fish stocks. You're seeing um, significant rises in ocean acidification, uh, which obviously has, a, has an effect on, um, on ocean life. Um, and the best way to save the oceans right now, I mean, we've got to basically change the way that we're fishing, but we have to stop climate change mm. because that will kill the oceans deader than anything. Okay, we've got about five or so minutes left before uh, the camera stops, and then I'll get you, you, people can grab a drink, come back and ask questions of the panellists. But I'll just get them to perhaps give us a minute. I'll try and keep a little time. Uh, just summing up their, I guess, their, their thoughts, their policy, their, their direction on the oceans. I'll start at this end of the table this time. Takuta, if you'd like yeah, to. Yeah, sure, Corin. Well, <coughs> the Māori Party um, stands to champion Māori solutions. Okay, and an indigenous presence, indigenous thinking, a voice for the Treaty of Waitangi, um, and amongst all of the issues that face this country. And that's not to take the position that that conversation is a one-sided conversation, it's a two-sided conversation. But um, as sure as the sun comes up and it goes down, um, indigenous thinking is always about maintaining the balance. And whenever you hear the word Modi, Modi is a, uh, it's, a it's an interesting thing to describe, but I best describe it as the balance. And if you can maintain the balance of something, it will thrive and everything around it will thrive with it. And that's where indigenous thinking comes from. That's, uh, it's based on thousands of years of practice. And it's likely to be the thing that saves us going into the future. So I'm standing for the Māori Party. And the reason I'm standing is this little girl right here and our kids. So kia kahara tātou. Kia ora, Scott. Thanks, um, Corin, um, and thanks everybody for participating in what I think is a really important issue, uh, essentially marine policy, um, and it's a, a, a view that I think um, is beyond uh, mere party politics, or it should be, and that's why I'm so frustrated that there has been so little action, in fact zero action, taken over the last three years, when there could have been plenty done if the government had chosen to reach out um, and actually work their, wa that, their way through that, as they did on other issues. So I think that's three years wasted, sadly. Um, I'm very proud of the record that uh, my former colleagues, um, Nick Smith, uh, Chris Finlayson and others have done in terms of providing um, what I think is a good framework for marine protected areas, uh, but nothing much has happened since. And I do think we need to uh, urgently write a piece of legislation that is going to encompass the currently 40 statutes 
that touch upon marine space in New Zealand. 40 statutes. It's a, it's a, it's a labyrinth that is incomprehensible, meaningless, and largely, um, I think, these days, ineffective, and it needs change, and change soon. James. So the sea should be protected from mining, from pollution, um, and from drilling. Marine protected areas should be expanded. Marine conservation areas should be expanded. Um, Māori, um, uh, hapū and iwi um, do have kaitiakitanga rights and responsibilities and should be involved in decisions about um, how we manage our oceans um, and, and, and fisheries management. Um, we do need to have um, a, a full uh, marine ecosystems approach uh, to the way that we do it, which is not the way that we currently do it. And um, we should encourage sustainable fishing practices, which we don't currently have uh, at the moment. Um, and if it gives you any sense of the priority that the Green Party takes it, it is one of the top priorities that we are taking into this election campaign. Um, and previously, you know, in previous campaigns, we've fought on fresh water, um, other conservation issues. This year, we're saying um, our oceans are at the limit and we need to do something about it in the next parliament. Jeff. Yeah, I mean, we've talked quite a lot tonight about the challenges facing our moana and I don't need to tell you about those, but there's also immense opportunities out there too. Uh, I, I mentioned, um, you know, seaweed farming, things like you know, a large, uh, extensive aquaculture, which is being uh, experimented with uh, in in your area. But um, what we really need to make all, to unleash all this sort of stuff is good marine spatial planning, including good um, a good network of marine protected areas that provides certainty for business and for the environment. Similarly, for our, our fish stocks and for all of the creatures that live in our, our ocean, we all benefit from having more life in our ocean. They are overfished, and that's hard for everyone, even for the fishers, uh, the fisher people, to actually find the fish. So it makes sense to do this stuff. We've just got to sit down and nut out how to make it happen. Angie. I'll start um, where I'll finish where I started. Really, um, I think it's really interesting tonight. Everyone has talked um, quite passionately about the sea and our environment, um, uh, Hinemoana and Tangaroa, and what we do um, with and in the sea. I think there is a way forward. It sounds like all of us have a willingness to get there. It's important that we have a balanced approach. It's important that we work together so that no one is left behind, but mainly that we move towards an eco-based system for fishing so that our future generations can benefit. All of us here sound like we have um, a good lot of will and a good lot of heart to do that. Um, what I will say finally though, uh, the National Party had nine long years to fix the system, and they didn't. So I'd just like to throw that last little bit in there. Well, we did a lot in nine years, and this government has done zip. All right, um, that's brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Now, uh, you can continue that after when we come back with the audience questions, if you like. But um, we've got about a, if the video is stopping, so that's finishing. Thank you to uh, all of those who have watched online uh, at home. Hope you've enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> It's an opportunity now for the audience to grab a drink. Uh, just relax for a minute or so, just a minute or two, not too long. Come back to your seats. And if you've got questions, we'll have a microphone. It's over by the window, and you can put your questions. We should have about 15, 20 minutes for those questions. Yeah, so a minute or two, that would be great. Thanks. <laughs>